true. Just say it real fast. John McLaughlin. Yeah. Faster. John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. McLaughlin. <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna. Uh, are we all recording right now? Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. Hello, my name is Sean Hartman. If you are a member of the incredible bongo band, you killed my father, prepare to die. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was, that had layers to it. That was an onion right there. It did. It did. It's a whole ass onion. 5,000 layers. <laughs> Wow, cool. 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 I'm anyone else? <laughs> cool. Well, I'm co host Jeremy Ruggles. And my dreams were shattered. I was going to be the world's greatest real estate appraiser, but my uncle refused to train me. And unfortunately they don't allow self taught real estate appraisers. <laughs> <laughs> Tough luck. What'd you do instead? Uh, I'm a CPA, certified public accountant. Yeah, self taught. Yeah, totally <laughs> self taught. <laughs> Bootstrapped his way. <laughs> okay, well, me llamo Pedro Cocinero y a me me gusta la guitarra flamenca. You are Peter, and you like the flamenco guitar. Yeah, you got it. That's pretty much what I said. Nice. Shout out to. Danielle Percy for helping me with that, the assist. Friend of the podcast. Virtual high five cent. Why would I speak my intro in Spanish, Jeremy? Well, because today we're talking Carlos Montoya, a Spanish guitar player. Yeah. We haven't really done anything along these lines previously, have we? Was it Leona Boyd, the player on the Christmas episode, at least? She was like a classically trained guitarist, right? True, but not flamenco. No. And that's kind of, it's a bit different. So let's play a tune so you can get an ear, an ear full of corrupted flamenco, but we'll get to that later. And we'll start with the first track on the album, Rondena. And that's side A track one, of course. Thank you. 
Thank you, co-host Jeremy, for bringing our first low-key metal album to the podcast. Yeah, that boy's a picker. (laughs) Full shred mode. Full shred mode on an acoustic guitar, too, which for non-guitar players out there, it's a lot easier on an electric guitar with distortion and everything to just go wild on notes like that, but to... To get those suckers ringing out on an acoustic guitar, that takes takes a lot. <laughs> now, would it be an acoustic guitar or a classical guitar? A classical guitar. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it's not easy. Those, and that's those nylon strings are are thick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, from what I could tell, and from what people were saying, he also would tune it down considerably so that the strings were kind of looser, and then he'd put a capo on the guitar to kind of move it back up into the normal range. So he had some type of weird thing going on with the strings being looser. I don't know if that's part of what enabled him to play so quickly, but yeah, it's like mind bendingly fast at times when he you know, like can't even discern the notes with your ear, but his, his hands are doing them. There are two artists that I've been thinking about that this guy kind of reminds me of. And they're people that stylistically it doesn't necessarily make sense. But the first one is Stephen Halpern. Because I always think back to the episode you hosted about him, Jeremy, where we highlighted how there was like this arrhythmic element to his music where you didn't know where the next chord was coming. So it lets your brain kind of relax and let it flow over you and like focus more on the emotional impact of the music than expecting or knowing when the next thing is coming. And this music kind of reminds me of that in a little way, because he's breaking the rules with tempo a little bit. It's more of a free form, like he's going fast and slow and it's this kind of very emotional experience. Yeah. And he's improvising a lot, which is, Mm -hmm. that is a definite parallel between him and Stephen Halpern and, yeah, the rhythmic thing, which uh, was really frowned upon by flamenco purists. He would kind of speed up and slow down, where like traditionally flamenco is like hard on the beat, and then they also have like these set rhythms for songs that like you follow these rhythms, or it's not a flamenco song. And he just kind of threw a lot of that out the window later in his career yeah very controversial so like we talked about on our flat and scruggs episode how there was the scruggs style banjo did this become montoya style flamenco (laughs) uh not necessarily i would say like in its time it was very popular but also like like i mentioned like very frowned upon by like flamenco conservative types but then after him comes Paco de Lucia who is celebrated for bringing classical and jazz elements to <laughs> flamenco playing yeah ain't that but, the way yeah <laughs> i mean you could you could make the parallels of uh you know earl scruggs followed by bela fleck yeah, like breaking slightly from tradition and then being followed by a celebrated guy who just throws tradition out of the window and does all kinds of experimentation. Definitely some flat and scruggs parallels. But the the second artist that I had in mind is uh, Ravi Shankar. Doesn't share the same parallels of rhythm as much, but the the thing that I just think about in relation to Ravi is that they're both guys that can shred mind blowingly fast, but it doesn't come off as an egotistical showing off it comes off as a very emotional masterful experience that you can still lose yourself in whereas i can't like lose myself just in music that is uh, technically adept there's plenty of jazz fusion records that i'm instantly bored by with almost equally fast playing yeah and 
I was reading a, an interview with Carlos where they were asking him about the sort of like academic study of flamenco that started happening. And he was like, you can't break it down that way. Like it's a feeling like some days I play and it's just garbage. And some days I play and it's unbelievable because it's an art and it's a feeling. And if you don't have that feeling, like it's not there. And yeah, it's that it kind of defies like a logical interpretation of it. Not to mention he was primarily self-taught and couldn't read music. He just figured it out by ear and playing a lot and changed the world of flamenco guitar along the way. A true innovator. This is a far cry from the DIY punk thing. Yes. <laughs> I, I kind of kept thinking about this in relation like you said, the artist it reminded you of, I kept thinking about like American primitivist guitar players like John Fahey and Robbie Basho, who explicitly were influenced by like Ravi Shankar, but I have a hard time believing that this wasn't an influence as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I feel like uh, another player along those same lines, Jack Rose, was, yeah. went into this stuff quite frequently in his playing yeah so i want to start a little from the top and give you a little background on flamenco so that you can understand why this is so revolutionary so carlos mentoya was born december 13th 1903 in madrid spain he is the nephew of an extremely celebrated flamenco guitar player Ramon Montoya, and Ramon actually refused to give Carlos lessons. His mother uh, approached him and wanted him to teach Carlos because Carlos was playing guitar and enjoyed it, and he said he was too busy. <laughs> so Carlos was actually initially taught by his mother. His father died at some point when he was very young, and his mother taught him the extreme basics, and then a neighbor named Pepe the Barber showed him everything he knew. Pepe el Barbero. Yeah. And everything Pepe knew lasted, like, 12-year-old Carlos, like, about a year. <laughs> and he had it all mastered and just needed more. And... Fortunately, his uncle did let him tag along with him on tour, and he still wasn't, like, teaching him anything directly, but he'd, like, let him kind of observe and pick up things if he paid attention. I think he was paying attention. I think he might have paid attention, because at age 14, he's playing professionally for... He's accompanying flamenco dancers and singers, and this is probably a good time to mention a little about flamenco. Flamenco was developed over hundreds of years and was the result of the Romani, a Romani population immigrating to southern Spain and kind of their folk traditions mixing with the local traditions there. And over time, it just kind of became flamenco, from my understanding. In flamenco, the singer is, you know, the lead star of it. The dancers are typically right up there with the singer, maybe a little bit below. But then the guitar, the last part of it, is like background noise. That's like they're just providing accompaniment for the, the stars, basically, to strut their stuff. Yeah, and the little bit that I read into the development of flamenco or the, the history of it, it seems that Jewish, Egyptian, and Indian elements worked their way in to the overall style. Yeah. Through that Romani immigration you were talking about. Yep. So that, that explains some things I was hearing when checking out a variety of Carlos Montoya's music. 
there was a lot packed in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a a blend of styles in reality, which is a funny thing to keep in mind later when these flamenco purists are like, this isn't flamenco. <laughs> You're blending things into it. Yeah. The blend the ability to blend stopped a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. So Ramon was revolutionary in his own way in the world of flamenco guitar because he brought the guitar to the forefront. He started making the guitar in the same level as the dancers and the singers and would even play songs with just guitar, which wasn't really happening before then. And he was, you know, playing those fast lines and like flashy melodic lines that people weren't really doing before. So he, I would say, influenced Carlos, and then Carlos kind of carried on that lineage of kind of breaking out of the shell of uh, flamenco traditions. So I'm going to play another song now that includes some of the dancing. You'll hear like the stomping and other percussive things going on with the guitar. So this is... Bulerius, and this is Side A, Track 3. You also got to hear a little of the singing in that one, though not not like a full-on, I forget, toccata, I think they call it. But yeah, you can hear the stomping of, those stomps are the dancer actually dancing around and stomping out these rhythms. And like I mentioned before, it's improvised, but it's also like improvised within this framework. There's... You know, when you're doing this type of song, it's going to have this rhythmic pattern and it's going to cycle through these chords most likely. So things, there's like a structure around it and then they're improvising within it. And you also heard like some clapping going on there, carrying some rhythms. They have like castanets sometimes and other percussive kind of things, so... Yeah, it's like, a, as you can hear there, that's like a full-on collaboration. You can hear them both kind of being equally on the same level, I'd say. Yeah, it gave it a bit of a field recording sound. Yeah, and part of that is this recording. Um, this is 
Everest Records, and their whole thing was just throwing up some microphones in front of, it was mostly classical performances, and they threw up some microphones in front of Carlos Montoya and said, do your thing. So yeah, it's got that very like raw, live feel to it, even though it's not like in front of an audience or anything like that. So what made you pick this record, Jeremy? Why did you buy this initially? Do you own any other flamenco records, or is this kind of a one-off? I do have some other flamenco and classical guitar records, which are kind of parallel in my mind, even though they're different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the Leona Boyd one was the closest one I could think of off the top of my head. Yeah, and I have lots of American primitive guitar, so... Anytime someone's just like ripping on a guitar fast, I'm there for it. But I don't have any other Carlos Montoya. I just picked this one up because it was a Carlos Montoya record. So you were available. So you were familiar with him by name. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was familiar with him by name, but I don't have a feel for which of his records are particularly different from other ones i know he has one called st louis to seville where he straight up blends jazz and flamenco oh i thought it was he was gonna blend jazz and alvin and the chipmunks (laughs) david seville good one peter (laughs) but yeah i didn't pick this one for any particular reason and trying to do research into this record there's just not a lot of info about most of his releases i've read in multiple places that there are over 40 studio albums if you look at his discography on wikipedia there's like six listed (laughs) but there's a ton of them out there and just not much information on them because most of them are you know through the 50s and 60s this one was pretty late in 72. Oh, geez, I had no idea that this was that late. <laughs> yeah, and he he just kept playing. Like, in 72, he would have been 69 years old. He's, you know, already to, like, retirement age when he's putting this album out. But he would go on to play for, like, 15 more years after this as well. I saw... A, performance of him on spanish television at age 80 (laughs) and he is just still shredding and watching like a man of that age and watching his hands just they look like machines yeah like it looks inhuman the way his his hands were moving it was wild to to see a video of it i'd highly recommend going like Look at one of the few videos out there of him playing. Did you get a sense, Jeremy, of when Carlos's heyday was? Like, was there a decade when he was at the height of popularity, or was he kind of just generally revered throughout his lifetime? I would say probably the 40s and 50s. So I guess we'll jump back to his history a little bit here. He's, you know, playing professionally at 14. And then he gets asked to join La Argentina, who was a big-time dancer in the flamenco scene. She asked him to tour with her across the world. So they're playing all over the world. In Japan at one point, somebody offers him a professorship at one of their universities, trying to get him to teach guitar in Japan. And he, he turned it down, but they like... Apparently they filmed videos of him playing and it became like educational material for years that like helped establish some flamenco playing in Japan. Yeah, I can imagine with his lack of formal training, he probably didn't feel comfortable in an educational role. Yeah, no. (laughs) And I don't think that's, I think he liked performing. That was his clearly what he enjoyed because he kept doing it until he was well into his 80s shout out to all the musicians who take it upon themselves to teach others music though thank you thank you 
Yeah, and like I was seeing in the 60s, he was playing like hundreds of concerts a year at that point. But so he's touring the world with these like famous flamenco dancers. And in 1939, a little thing called World War II breaks out. And he happens to be touring America at the time the war is breaking out. And he decides to just kind of settle down in America and not go back. Yeah, he had a couple years to just hang out here before it really popped off. Yeah. Yeah, so he settled in New York. And back home, Franco takes over during the Civil War there in Spain, who is a pretty bad dictator, if, if you know history. And initially, Franco was did not like flamenco and in fact well it was partially because flamenco artists were speaking out against the franco nationalist army and a lot of flamenco artists died like on the war front actually fighting franco (laughs) so it's not just like they were just saying mean things they were fighting them with guns and dying but Later on, kind of into his dictatorship, he kind of like appropriated and embraced flamenco and tried to like use it as an identity thing. Like, this is true Spanish identity. Of course he did. Yeah. (laughs) Classic dictator dick move. (laughs) Yeah. So meanwhile, back in America, Carlos is being exposed to blues and jazz, of course. And these elements kind of start making their way into his playing. Previous to this, you know, he was self-taught and stuff, but he was still sticking pretty to tradition, I would say, before settling in America. And that's when things really started to seep into his playing style. Um, He performed for Harry Truman... In 1946, the president of the United States and was performing with orchestras around the country, doing these like recitals and really elevated the flamenco guitar to like a whole nother level that he was the face of it in America and kind of around the world at that point. And beyond allowing the kind of jazz and blues and classical influences into his playing, he became especially targeted by flamenco purists because he abandoned the compas, which is like the rhythms, those established structures to, you know, these are the rhythms you will play if you're playing a flamenco song. He just kind of stopped following those. And also started allowing, as you kind of pointed out in that first clip, that sort of speeding up and slowing down and kind of introducing this sort of like romantic element into it that hadn't been there before and proved to be enormously popular. He was playing on TV shows. Like I mentioned, he put out like 40-something albums over the... 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Yeah, it uh, it caught on. <laughs> People liked it. People liked it. And his records are quite plentiful in the bargain bin today. His, his level of popularity uh, makes sense with his records just being everywhere now. Yeah, and there were just he just made a lot of them. It was mm-hmm. just one after another, and he was performing non-stop so um i wanted to feature a song that is uh one more focused on vocals so that you can kind of hear that element of flamenco the song is fandangos which i should probably point out all these like song names are basically just like a type of song and they're not like specific to this song in reality yeah if you listen to a live album of his and it has like that title it's not necessarily going to sound the same yeah 
Yeah, it's like that. It'd be like if I named a song like reggae song. <laughs> yeah, you kind of know what it's going to sound like, but it's not a specific name because it's improvised each time. Now, you said this one will have a prominent vocal. Is he the vocal? No, the vocalist is Nino de Almaden. And this is side two, track one. typically always thought of flamenco as closer to a classical style of music and listening to these Carlos Montoya songs it it feels like folk music you know it it feels like a field recording like Peter had said before it's just a whole different vibe than what I had necessarily been expecting but I like it a lot yeah I think the Sort of the way flamenco guitar found its way into classical guitar styles, and that's what most people are exposed to. I could, I mean, it makes sense for that association to be there. But yeah, it's initially a folk style. You can hear in that vocal, that was extremely passionate. You can hear the star power, I thought. Uh, Carlos did well staying kind of back and supporting when the vocal was actually going. And then, you know, when he's not singing, he was going nuts. But yeah, feels like something you could have just heard on a street corner somewhere. Best street corner around. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty much covers it. Carlos lived until 1993 and lived to be. 89 years old, and I could confirm that he was playing until at least age 82, though I suspect probably longer, and he, you know, as I mentioned before, paved the way for people like Paco de Lucia, and presumably some of the American primitive guitar players, and some of the classical players who would incorporate flamenco into their styles and all the metal guitarists and all the metal guitarists (laughs) including eddie van halen who listed carlos as an influence oh wow yeah yeah 
So that's what I got to say about Carlos. Sean, Mm -hmm. if people liked Carlos, but they can't find one of his 40-something albums out there, yeah. <laughs> Can you recommend some alternatives? I got a couple ideas. Uh first up, a another famous flamenco guitarist who put out a record in the same year as this one, Paco Peña, The Art of the Flamenco Guitar from 1972. And from my understanding that is more of a traditionalist style than what we're hearing today. Yeah, I can't imagine that every player broke the rules, reinvented the game like Carlos, because otherwise he wouldn't stand out. Yeah, he definitely had people that followed in his innovations, but there was certainly other people who were sticking to the way it had been done for hundreds of years. Next up is one that we've talked about before that I thought has some similarities, even though it is certainly not a flamenco album, Los Indios Tabajares, Maria Elena from 1958. Whoa, you're recommending our second episode ever, not our first one, the Jimmy yeah, Spheris. I, I just couldn't recommend Jimmy Spheris. Although, you know, it's pretty good. If you want something entirely different, I would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you hated this record. <laughs> and last up, a album that sold very well and was probably a lot of people's only flamenco record in their collection at a certain time. Al D. Miola, John McLaughlin, or McLaughlin, couldn't completely nail down the correct pronunciation, and Paco De Lucia, who we mentioned. They did a trio acoustic live album in 1981 called Friday Night in San Francisco, which is pretty darn good. I listened through a lot of that, and I can recommend it safely. I have to say, when you were talking earlier about like fusion guitarists who play really fast and flashy, Al De Miolos, who came to mind for me, were like some of his records. I put them on, and they're just jarring in their technical prowess. Like yeah, it's right I, up in my face. I can't get behind most of his electric stuff that I've heard, but this record is acoustic and yeah, doesn't have the same level of in your face shred that you get when you plug the guitar in. Yeah, I wonder if. Carlos ever picked up an electric guitar? I couldn't see anything that indicated he did. I mean, everything I've ever heard of him and everything I've seen video wise, he's playing, you know, traditional nylon flamenco guitar. I want to hear him do eruption. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good, Sean. Those are some cool things to keep an eye out for. When scouring the bins, we would like to remind our listeners that it helps us a great deal if you leave us a review of the podcast. A five-star review is preferable. Yeah, so say a good <laughs> review would be even better. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind words go a long way to helping others find us, you know, others who, like-minded who are looking for vinyl podcasts. Oh my gosh. I didn't say LP, I said vinyl. Yeah, it's uncharacteristic of you, Peter. <laughs> but yes, please, if you can, if you have just a few minutes, it probably takes you three minutes to leave a good review for us. That'll help others find us as well. You could be doing it right now. You could listen and be just being like, this show's sick, five stars. <laughs> and be sure to write which is your favorite co-host. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, name your favorite son, please. <laughs> and with that, it's probably time to head on out of here, boys. What were we going to leave on, Jeremy? What did you select? I wanted to go back to another guitar only to put Carlos back in the spotlight by himself. So this last one is Wajitas, and it is the last track on the album, Side B, track four. Fantastic. Thank you for listening to I'd Buy That for a dollar. Me llamo Pedro Cocinero. Me llamo co-host Jeremias. And I'm Sean Hartman. <laughs> <laughs>